Thank you very much. And I'm conscious that you've all had already a very full day. And I'm also conscious that many of you came expressly to hear Ian talk and meet him in person. Um, and Ian has prepared uh, a, a lecture, you know, something substantive directed at this event, the theme of difference from his work. So I'm going to introduce him, introduce the context of his work a little bit for those who don't know it. Um, then step aside, let Ian take the stage, speak to him for 15 or so minutes myself, and then pass on to you for Q&A. Um, and I'm, I'm guessing we're going to have more questions and we'll have time to answer. So do think not only about what you want to ask, but how you want to ask it in the next, you know, while Ian's talking. Um, it's a real honor to introduce Ian McGilchrist. I've now known Ian since 2011. There was a moment when I was working at the Royal Society of Arts in London when our, the chief executive there, Matthew Taylor, who normally chaired events, just couldn't do the one with Ian. And two days before, I was given his fairly large, but not quite as large as the current book, the master and his emissary. And I was very excited. I thought, well, very interesting, bold thesis here. Started reading it. And on the evening of the event, Matthew actually showed up uh, backstage just before we were about to go on stage. And I was like, oh, please tell me I can share this event. Please, like, don't, you know, last minute. But actually, it worked. I went on stage, with, spoke to Ian, and that was the beginning of a very important professional relationship for me. And since then, I've done a great deal of work promoting Ian's ideas. Um, I feature in a documentary about him, visited his house on Sky, and now, by many strange twists of fate, became the publisher of his most recent book, The Matter With Things. Now, as some of you may know, and even if you don't know, you can just glance at it here, if you can see the I might hold it up if I have the strength in my left arm. <laughs> but this is um, two very significant sized tomes, two volumes of The Matter With Things. And I believe Ian may have the precise details, but the words alone are roughly 600,000. But then that's just really kind of where it's getting started, because you also have quite significant appendices, notes, bibliography, references, index. So by the, by the end of it, it's something approaching a million words, I believe, for, for both volumes together. Um, but they're wonderful, wonderful, wonderful words. And many have read every one of them. And some have described it as you know, really the book of our times, the book that everyone must read. Of course, there's many of them, but this is one of them, I think. Um, and it's very, very deep. And it does deal with uh, very fundamental matters about the nature of life, the purpose of life and the meaning of life towards the end of the second book, especially. Um, so I just wanted to share one more thing, which is that when I was describing um, my experience of reading this book, I posted a photograph of a large pencil um, that comes from the United Nations. So one of these sort of souvenir pencils. And it was, paste, it was put along the spine of the book diagonally, so it looked, you could sort of see the sort of significance of the book somehow in the image. It's the, you know, it's the social media age. I was doing what I could. Um, and then somebody said to me, ah, yes, this is actually a three-pencil book. And I said, three-pencil book? He goes, yeah, that's the sort of, um, you know, the amount of times that you have to scribble and take notes and underline and write in the marginalia all the different things about the book. This was Damien uh, Walters, I think his name is, who's a science fiction writer. I said, only three pencils for a book of this size? He goes, well, the complete works of Shakespeare are only two and a half. So, so you, you can see there, it's really a, a commitment to read the book, but one that's richly re rewarded. And I believe Ian's going to speak to some major themes from it. So um, I think for now, that's all I can say and look forward to talking to Ian later. Ian McGilchrist, everyone. Well, um, thank you very much, and I, I hope you will tell me if I'm not audible. Um, I'm told the thing is to have it as close to your beard as possible without touching it. I'm going to try and do that for however long I speak. Uh, I'm also rather sorry that I have to do a, a sort of Tom Jones impersonation. Uh, um, I'm slightly beyond that, but uh, this is the way the system works. I'm very pleased to be here. I'm delighted. And I think that this is the right audience, the ideal audience to engage with what I felt I was doing in writing this inexcusably long book. 
I myself, if told that this book was terribly important and I really got to read it, would say, well, how long is it? And when I was told, well, the text goes to 1300 and something pages, I'd have said, well, forget it. Um, I hope, though, that you can be encouraged to dip into it. Um, it covers <laughs> it covers a lot of ground. And um, I think it's quite permissible to dip into chapters and see how that works. And then I'm rather hoping that in the end you'll see that it's it's a single story, if you like, and it's best if you can read it that way. Why did I write it? Like many people here, I feel that we are, we've reached a crisis point in which, frankly, we no longer know who we are. We haven't the foggiest idea what we're doing here in this world. We don't seem to understand any kind of direction or meaning in our lives. And if we find any, we're told that we've just painted them on uh, the walls of our little cell in order to cheer ourselves up. I can't tell you how profoundly I disagree from that, disagree with that formulation, which seems to be a pervasive one these days, that of reductive materialism. And A.N. Whitehead, who's a philosopher I very greatly admire, said, as we think, we live. And I think there's something wrong with our thinking processes, and that's what I was hoping to have a little influence over. Um, you may know that I wrote an earlier book called The Master and His Emissary, and that concerns the division of the brain into two hemispheres. And this book, the newer book, uh, also begins from that standpoint. This is not reductive in any sense, I mean, it has been put to me by one person, only one person, but he does persistently say it. <laughs> um, he's a philosopher who will remain, uh, remain nameless. I want to spare him his blushes. But he seems to think that just because I talk about the structure of the brain, I must be reducing mind to brain. However, I've now, over pretty much 2,000 pages between those two books, made it very clear that my whole thrust is anti-reductionist. Why would one be interested in the structure of the brain? You might well say, I'm really interested in the mind, but I don't really care where things go on in my brain. It's not relevant. And I'm sympathetic with that. But I also think there's something very, very important about the way the brain is structured. And whether the brain gives rise to consciousness, which I can't believe, or it transmits consciousness, which it might, or it permits consciousness, which is what I do believe, it will shape the nature of that consciousness. And it's therefore quite relevant that this organ is divided in two right down the middle. If you've never seen a brain, it's rather like a walnut, and it has that division down the middle. If you have an organ which is said to be um, a computer, I mean, uh, that's a, an image that I... I, I very much detest, and it's entirely wrong on a whole range of grounds. But if you do think of it as having computing power, why would you make an enormous division down the middle of it, since its computing power exists in the number of connections it can make? Why is the brain asymmetrical? The world around us isn't asymmetrical exactly, and, and the skull is pretty much symmetrical. So what's this about? Why is the right hemisphere broader at the front and larger altogether? In fact, the biggest asymmetry in the entire brain is the largeness of the right frontal cortex. And why, something that one did learn about in medical school and never heard about the right hemisphere, um, it's broader towards the back on the left, and this was always said to be because of the invention of language, which is a very important part of the history of humanity. But that can't be right, because we know that um, plenty of the great primates, um, bonobos, ape, you know, gorillas, um, chimpanzees, have these expansions, but they don't have language. And I suppose the final thing is, these two hemispheres are connected by a band of fibers at the base of the brain, over which 2% of the neurons in the brain actually cross. So it's set up for two rather distinct um, conscious nexuses. Why is that? Is it just us? No, it isn't. Um, the difference between us and 
uh, or at least mammals and other living creatures, is that they don't even have a corpus callosum. So the corpus callosum was a mammalian invention, and it's gradually getting smaller in relation to the size of the brain. So our brains have expanded, but the corpus callosum remains small, and a lot of its traffic is saying, I'm dealing with this, you keep out of it. <laughs> and, and that's true as you go down, as we like to think of it, down the evolutionary tree. So it's true of amphibians, it's true of reptiles, it's true of um, insects, it's true of um, every creature that we know of, including the most ancient creature, uh, still extant. It's 700 million years old, Nematostella vectensis, and it lives off the Isle of Wight, where it only marginally raises the average age of the inhabitants. <laughs> and it's... Um, uh, and it already has this asymmetry in its neural network described by Thomas Holstein, who discovered it at um, Heidelberg, as the origin of the mammalian and eventually the human brain. Well, I think there is an answer to that, and it's quite a simple one. And I've never heard any explanation that goes near doing as good a job. And nobody's told me I'm wrong. And it's this. Every living creature has to be able to do two incompatible things at once. They have to enable themselves to survive by eating, and they have to enable themselves to survive by not being eaten. And for the first, you need to have highly targeted, precise attention to a detail, for a bird to pick up that seed accurately and swiftly, um, for um, an eagle to be able to catch that hair. Whatever it is, you lock onto your target, you know what it is, you go for it. And that detention is very, very precise, but it's only about three out of the 360 degrees of um, the, the purview that we might have. Meanwhile, the right hemisphere, sorry, I hadn't mentioned yet that the left hemisphere is the one that does the targeting. The right hemisphere is tasked with doing the whole of the rest, basically, of seeing the whole picture, looking out for predators, looking out for contraspecifics, looking out for offspring that need feeding and protecting. And so this can't be done, actually. It's, um, it's not just like trying to pat your tummy and rub your head or whatever it is you're supposed to do, pat your head and rub your tummy. Yes, but, um, it's actually impossible unless you have two ways in which you can dispose your consciousness at once. And that requires two neuronal masses capable of being conscious at all. So that explains this division. And it's based, as I say, on attention. And when I realized this, the penny didn't drop immediately because I had been trained in a rigorously analytic, cognitive way, and I saw attention as another interesting cognitive function, like memory and language and so on. But no, attention is something very, very special. It's how we bring the world into being. Let me just explain a little about that because it's central to what I'm going to say. I repudiate either of the two main alternatives that are put up these days um, in the public arena as possible ways of understanding the world. I think most of us detect that it's not quite true that there's just a world out there. First of all, it might not be out there. And secondly, it's not just out there in that we are connected to it somehow, and how we experience it changes, at least the, the weak claim is it changes for us what it is we experience, that's obvious. I believe it actually helps to mold what is there in a less personal way, in a more universal way, eventually. But it also makes us who we are. So if I get in the habit of attending to things that are living as machines, I will see only their mechanical aspects and I will see that this, this works very well. And, and so it worked last time, it'll work next time. And soon I can't see any alternative to seeing living things as mechanisms. So I call attention a moral act by which I mean that we have a responsibility. And that word responsibility is important because it suggests a coming and a going the giving of something and something responding, a reverberative relationship. I actually also claim in this book and argue for the position that relationships are primary. So relationships are prior to the things that are related. 
the so-called relata. How can that be, you might say? How can you have relation before you've got the things that need to be related? Well, I take the view that actually everything is related and that it gets its being from the context of all the other things to which it's primarily very directly related, but ultimately to the rest. And that therefore it, you can't tell what that thing is until you've understood the network of webs of relationships out of which it arises. In any case, attention is important in this way. And I have this view that it's neither um, what I call rot, reality out there, and we are just passive receivers of it, nor is it mumbo, um, um, uh, made up miraculously by ourselves. Um, sorry, those were acronyms in case you... <laughs> um, it's something very important, an encounter. So every experience is an encounter, and it's not made up of things, it's made up of encounters with what are effectively processes, relationships. For this reason, the way in which we attend to the world matters enormously. And the title of my um, latest offering, this enormous book, is The Matter With Things, which is can be read on several levels. I mean, on, on the first level, obviously, I think we probably all agree there's something that is the matter with things. Um, and I think that what's the matter is our obsession with matter, partly. Um, at least if you assume matter is the simple stuff that has nothing to do with consciousness, if you think it has a bit of consciousness about it, then you've already smuggled consciousness in, and we don't have to explain how it somehow mysteriously arises out of matter. But if you think of matter as simple, well, you're onto a hiding to nothing because if matter has nothing of consciousness about it and has no direction and no knowledge of any of the things that make life worth living for us, how is it that after a few million years, this completely blind collision of senseless particles gives rise to Bach's St. Matthew passion? This is a miracle, if ever there was one. And reductionists always end up having to do a and here a miracle happens. Uh, I don't do that because I believe, and I may come on to that later, I believe that consciousness is foundational. I think it is what the philosophers call an ontological primitive, which means it can't be derived from anything else. It is the primary stuff of the cosmos. But if attention changes what we experience, how we relate to it, how we act, how we think, it's pretty important. And if the two halves of the brain have manifestly different ways of attending, and there's not a single neurologist, psychiatrist, physician, neuroscientist anywhere in the world who will deny that these two hemispheres have this greatly different way of attending. If that's the case, then it follows that they produce two different kinds of experiential worlds. They'd have to. And I haven't got time to go through all the things that differentiate them, but let me just give a sort of lightning sketch of how they differ. So you can see that if you are paying attention to something that you already know is important for you and latching onto it, and then later latching onto something else and then seeing one of those two, um, it, it produces a picture of isolated fragments that are already known, familiar, useful. They're decontextualized, they're abstracted because they're an example of a kind. It's another seed, another rabbit, whatever. The differences between Peter Rabbit and his brethren are not available to the left hemisphere. And this picture in the left hemisphere is one which is effectively inanimate, literal. It takes language literally because it's not very good at reading subtle signs. So body language, facial expression, tone of voice. You don't even need to get into the complexities of metaphor, but already the right hemisphere is much more skilled at this than the left. But the, the left hemisphere simply takes poetry, metaphors, literally, and then pronounces, as some philosophers have, that they're lies. However, the ancient Greeks thought that metaphors were the key to understanding. Aristotle says that this is the the key to every kind of thinker. 
the strength of that thinker or of that artist is to be able to produce new metaphors that illuminate. And indeed, um, I think it's very well accepted now that all language is metaphorical, in particular scientific language and philosophical language are metaphorical because they're often dealing with abstractions and we don't have the words for those, we have the words for the things we encounter in daily life. So you've got on the one hand this picture of isolated fragments that have no meaning, purpose or direction until we put them together, that are um, inanimate, decontextualized, abstracted, and they go together to form a picture of a lifeless diagram, a theory, a map of the world. Now there's nothing wrong with a map, and there's nothing wrong with the left hemisphere. We need it but it won't give us the full story, just as consulting a map of this area before you came wouldn't tell you what you see outside the window, what you would experience in this house. That's all left, as it were, in the realm of the right hemisphere. So, what does the right hemisphere see? It sees that nothing is ever certain, fixed and fully known, that there is always a degree of possibility that it may be something slightly different, and indeed, since it sees unique cases rather than just general categories, it's aware that actually every blade of grass is different. So it sees a picture of these ungraspable, but processually knowable, not known already completely, but something we can come into and knowing all, it sees them as interconnected with other things, constantly flowing, not fixed down so that we can easily grasp them. Um, and as I say, individual, implicit, and embodied. Now, in, it, all that implicit and embodied stuff is terribly important, and it's all the kind of things that a computer um, won't be able to understand uh, until it's got a body and until and blood is flowing through its chips, and it knows that it's going to die, and it's suffered, and so on. So the left hemisphere is, I hate the, the um, idea that the brain is like a computer, as I've already said, but um, there is something about the left hemisphere that is rather like one's personal computer, in that its level of understanding is very low, very poor, but it's very efficient at carrying out procedures. There's a division of labor, really. The right hemisphere is rather like you when you've gathered data and you want the computer to process it. So you shove it into the computer. The computer whirs away cleverly for a, a short while and produces an answer. The computer doesn't know what the answer means, but you take that back into the real lived world and reinterpret it. So it's this dynamism in which you begin from the right hemisphere, move to the left and move to the right. And I'm indebted to Jonathan for having christened this the McGill Chris Maneuver. I, I don't believe it's a maneuver, but anyway, whatever. Um, and it's best imaged by the idea of learning a piece of music. You're first attracted to it as a whole by the right hemisphere. The, the right hemisphere sees the whole picture. The left hemisphere sees parts and analyzes. So then you start to play it and you realize that you've got to take it apart. You've got to really keep practicing that passage of bar 18. And, and then you sort of understand the theory of this structure of the piece. So you see, oh, it's here that we return to the tonic. And that's all very well. It's important. It's good. But when you go out to play the piece, finally, you must forget all of that. We will give a most terrible performance. And there's very much in life that is like this. But at the moment, I believe we live in a world in which we take the lived experience. We then turn it into a map, a theory, a diagram, take it apart, leave it bits all over the floor, and then go, well, it doesn't seem to mean anything to me. And this is surely a very bad way to be understanding the vibrant, living, complex, rich, beautiful world around us. So that's the, the sort of neurology part of it, if you like. And I begin the book, it has three parts. In um, part one, I talk about um, the neuropsychology, and I begin with looking at the ways in which we could gather some knowledge about the world, to gather it, not to process it, but just to begin the process of having anything there. And I take these to be attention, but also perception, which is not the same as attention, judgment, which is formed on the basis of what you've attended to and what you've perceived, emotional and social intelligence, and cognitive intelligence, IQ in other words, and 
creativity because nothing ever comes to us um, just as a blank. It comes to us as a something. And sometimes we need to be able to revision what that is before it sets. So we can do this very, very rapidly so that we don't even know that we're doing it. But all those faculties, all those portals to the world, as I call them, are more reliably exercised by the right hemisphere than by the left, all of them, including um, cognitive intelligence, IQ. It's very, very clear, and that might surprise a lot of people. And you may well say, well, that's ridiculous. That can't be. I mean, how on earth would we get by with a brain that only half of which is really reliable? Well, the answer is that the very important business of getting stuff, accumulating power, is the job of the left hemisphere, and that it does exceptionally well. So that when you have a stroke in the left hemisphere, the right hand with which you manipulate the world and use tools and operate machines is um, dysfunctional or, or non-functional. Um, you, you, you may lose the power to use language. And one way of looking at language is we didn't need it when we lived in small communities where we understood one another directly and lived together, but we needed it as communities became larger and larger. And instead of having I-thou communication, we had to have I-it communication and I-they communication, and um, that is also damaged. But get this, it's much easier to rehabilitate somebody after a left hemisphere stroke, despite all that, than it is after a right hemisphere stroke, because somebody who has a right hemisphere stroke may well not understand the world at all. It's not that they can't manipulate it. They just can't understand it. And people complain that their partner, if they have a partner who suffered such an injury or stroke, is no longer empathic in the way that they used to be doesn't seem to understand a joke, doesn't seem to understand what's going on around him, doesn't understand the conversation. So um, that's kind of important. In the second part of the book, I deal with epistemology, which is how do we get from our findings, our, our data, our information, our percepts, our judgments, how do we get from there to broader conclusions about the world? And how do we build up a picture of the world? And I, I suggest that there are four of these, um, science, reason, intuition, and imagination. And in the world in which we live, none of these is quite perceived right. So excessive claims are made for science, and at the same time, science is not scientific enough. If science were properly scientific, it wouldn't be as dogmatic as it is. It wouldn't dismiss things that don't fit the current paradigm, because the whole history of science is of people finding things that don't fit the current paradigm and then revising. Um, and uh, again, we don't respect science enough, so there are now movements to disrespect science or disregard science or refuse to publish science if it doesn't happen to fit with your political view. This sounds remarkably like 1930s Germany. Then there is reason, and reason is very important. And again, I think the world has lost it's reason. It's lost its reasonableness. How rarely do we hear that concept, which seems to be central, of the reasonable, not just the rationalistic. And I'm making a distinction there, which is made in other languages, between different types of reason. In German, there's a difference between Vernunft and Verstand. And uh, there's a kind of procedural logic, which is not unnecessary. It's very important. But you ought to be able to synthesize that with the products of a life well lived, of a kind of experiential wisdom, and that is reason. And then there's intuition, which has had a very bad press lately because there are lots of psychologists who go around um, to companies um, making a lot of money telling them they must never trust their intuitions because they're all wrong. Um, and, and, and psychologists rather like um, the feeling of having power over other people and seeing things they don't see. And so there's a kind of a chauvinism about um, their wish to dispense with intuition. But I say the, the, the examples they come up with, in which is quite true, our intuition would probably guide us to the wrong answer. There are such things that can be set up and are deliberately set up by psychologists. They draw on principles that would normally lead us to the right conclusion, but on this occasion just don't happen to. And I can show you optical illusions, which are so extraordinary that you can't believe it until it's demonstrated. 
Um, and yet, I don't know many people who say, well, after seeing that, I'm never going to open my eyes again because they might mislead me. We need these faculties. And imagination, I just want to make a, an important distinction between imagination and fantasy, or fancy. Fantasy is something that takes us away from where we are. And it's sometimes thought that imagination is like this as well. But imagination is not. Imagination is the only way in which we can truly enter into and understand the life, the existence of whatever it is we're contemplating. So that's an, a, it's a completely different thing, imagination. Wordsworth and Coleridge wrote about this very interestingly. I haven't got time to talk about that now. But they did, and they contrasted the sort of dressing up of something in a fancy way in order to make it look different and funny or moving or sentimental. Um, they contrasted that with the sort of deep gaze of attention in which the thing at last is permitted to come to be itself in your presence. It, in, a, in a word of Heidegger's, well, the translation of what Heidegger use in German and reason, it, 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 um, it uh, presences. And that's slightly different from being present. Being present is very passive, but the idea of presencing is the thing comes into being through the encounter. Now, in the, in the world we're in at the moment, I just think there's an awful lot already that one could say that we're missing here. But what I do, and I'll just finish the, the counter through the book, part three is, so... We've looked at which hemisphere is more trustworthy, and the answer is, in almost every case, the left hemisphere will mislead us, is literally delusional. I'm not using that word in a pop sense, I'm using that in a psychiatric sense. It gives rise to frank delusions left for itself. It's not reliable, so we know that. We know we should be paying attention to what the right hemisphere tells us, even if it's harder to grasp. And we now know that we need to bring at least three out of these four, science, reason, intuition, and imagination, if not all four, to bear on all our problems. But I find that generally we divide into camps who use either the first two or the last two or nothing at all. That's three camps. Um, then we come on to the, um, the last part of the book. And in that, I just sort of say, well, how do we understand the cosmos and ourselves? How do we understand our position here? What do we think the cosmos is like? And I begin with a couple of chapters about its structure. The first one is on the coincidence of opposites, which is a very, very important point, which has gone out of our culture, and with it has gone some massively important insights, wise insights. We think that things are... Um, arranged in linear fashion. So on one end of a line, there's something you like. On the other end, there's something you hate. And it's just where you graduate yourself on this position. But this is not true. If you pursue something that you think is good more and more, you will, indef you will definitely end up with the thing that you were fleeing from. Thus, it's famous that anarchy leads to tyranny. Um, and we don't understand this. It was obvious to me as a child that people on the extreme left of politics were awfully like people on the extreme right of politics. But the answer in uh, calibrating these things is not just to find a midpoint where things go flabby, as it were. Um, the secret of making a good apple tart is have sour apples and lots of good honey. And this produces a wonderful apple tart, but just bland apples won't produce anything. And the image I like to give here is one that is made by my fam favorite philosopher of all time, Heraclitus, 6th century BC, far more interesting than Plato. They're called pre-Socratic philosophers. I think <clears throat> the, the, the so-called um, Platonic philosophers should be called post-Heraclitean philosophers, but anyway. <laughs> in, in this realm, there were a lot of very interesting voices, and then we got thrown off track for about 2,000 years, and we began to recover it in the 19th century. Um, yeah, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm being brief and flippant. Um, I'm a great admirer of Plato. I studied him in Greek at school. I know all of that. But nonetheless, I think that there's a lot about the way in which Plato has been interpreted, his legacy, and Aristotle's legacy, um, that we have had to try and finesse and 
make more complex and pass on from. Um, the image from Heraclitus is that of the string of a lyre, the musical instrument, or the string of a bow. And the, the point he makes is it must be pulled apart in both directions very hard. And you might say, well, that's a waste of energy. Why don't we just let it go slack? And then, of course, the string will not let fly the note. It will not let fly the arrow. So the tension between these opposites held together, but not collapsed into one or the other, but both genuinely held is very important. And some people get around this by collapsing the two in and just saying they're all one. But they're not all one. They're importantly rather different. Or they say they're, um, they're so different from one another that you can't say that they coincide. I, I would suggest that both of these positions is wrong. And then um, I talk about the one and the many. I won't go into that, but that's another whole famous philosophical problem that I think is very interesting about the relation between the general and the unique um, and the particular and the eternal. And the insight I just want to pass on briefly is one that I think is best expressed in the work of Goethe, which is that you find the particular, sorry, you find the general and the universal not by turning your back on the particular, but by going through the particular more deeply. And you find um, eternity not by turning your back on the temporal, but by going through the temporal and seeing eternity um, there in the, in the temporal. That, of course, is itself a paradox, but I'm no foe of paradox. In part two, I have a whole chapter on logical paradox, which I think explains, I, I take about 30 ones known to philosophers and suggest that the reason that these paradoxes arise uh, is that there is a conflict here between the way the left hemisphere sees it and the way the right hemisphere sees it. And guess what? The way the right hemisphere sees it is more in touch with reality. I give the example of Achilles and the tortoise. You know, Achilles was famously swift of foot. The tortoise challenged him to a race. Achilles said, mm, no, I don't think so. He said, go on, you can never catch me. And Achilles thinks, well, okay. And being a generous kind of guy gives the tortoise a head start. The tortoise, however, is right. Because, first of all, Achilles has got to get where the tortoise now is. But by the time he gets there, the tortoise has moved on to a new place. Now his job is to get to where the tortoise has gone to. But by the time he gets there... The tortoise has moved on, and this is a, an infinite series, so he can never actually overtake the tortoise. However, we know that he'll overtake the tortoise in two strides. And the problem there, which I can't unpack now because I've got to get to the end of my talk quite quickly, um, is, um, is that effectively the mistake is thinking of a continuum retrospectively as fragmented and analyzed. Um, and then in the rest of the chapters of part three, I deal with the trivia, time, yeah. space, matter, consciousness, value, purpose, and the sense of the sacred. And, and most people are with me when we go, time, yes, yeah, very interesting, yes, yeah, space, mm, yeah, and matter and consciousness are very important. But, but what the hell? Why do you put values, purpose, and the sense of the sacred in there? And I believe these are things that are absolutely essential to our understanding of the universe, of the cosmos, and of life. And they've been dismissed from discourse um, by science, not out of malice, but out of a very good principle. It decided that the way it wanted to investigate things was what it calls objective. And in that, it didn't want to introduce values. It didn't want to introduce any kind of purpose. It just wanted to see what was there. And then it reports back solemnly after its investigation. Couldn't find any values, couldn't find any purpose. But to borrow an image from C.S. Lewis, this is like a policeman who stops all the traffic in the street and then solemnly notes in his notebook, the silence in this street is very suspicious. So it is that science has not proved that life is meaningless, that there is no purpose, that there are no values. It's not its job to do that. And we need to see that, and it needs to see that. But I believe that all consciousness, and let, let me say it very briefly, I think that consciousness and matter relate like this. I believe that consciousness is the primary substance of the universe, if you like, although substance is exactly the wrong word because nothing needs to be under it. It is the stuff, if you like, of the cosmos. But again, it's not stuff. Our language stuffs us when we try to talk about this matter. Um, so consciousness 
is that elementary stuff, and consciousness is always directed towards something, something else. We are seeing something, we are taking, being aware of something, we are examining something, we are just contemplating something, but that is directional, and it's guided by value, and it's guided by purpose, and these things are throughout in the living world, and I would say having read Jude Caravan's latest uh, book, which is very interesting, that in, in that she's very, a lot of the book is about the pre-animate world, that there is evidence of clear purpose and value in terms of beauty already present in this cosmos. I think what life does is not just bring consciousness, because as I say, consciousness I think is everywhere, but it brings two things. It speeds up the process of responsiveness and intensifies it and broadens it. So, unlike the rock in my garden, I can appreciate more of what there is in the cosmos. That's life given to me. And what that life means is something that I can come to understand very much faster than any of the processes that would have existed pre-life. There are animate processes that can happen a thousandth of a second that if they were in an inanimate context would take billions of years. So what is matter? Well, I think matter is a phase of consciousness. I think that consciousness exhibits matter to us. That's indisputable. We wouldn't know matter if we didn't have consciousness. However, it's not true that we wouldn't know conscious, consciousness if we weren't material. We don't know that. We, a lot of scientists assume the brain somehow, nobody has ever got even with a whisker of explaining how it could possibly happen. But if matter were to give rise to consciousness, it's a matter of dispute. And I, I for one, reject it. But we can't deny that matter is something that's in our experience. Uh, and I say, well, why is matter there? I think it does one main thing that can be seen in two ways. It, it, it allows things to persist for a while, always only for a while. And it also offers some resistance. And I believe that creation, creativity, depends on resistance. In the face of resistance, it can't happen. And the resistance is paradoxical like everything else. What is friction? Friction is what stops motion. That's what a physicist will tell you. But it's also what starts motion. I'm not able to move at all without friction. So things have dual roles, and this resistance is highly creative, as has been seen by many of my favorite philosophers, including Whitehead and others. So where am I going with this? <laughs> I could talk to you about the sense of the sacred. I included a chapter on that, and many of my philosophical friends who'd read the draft said, don't include it. Um, you've got some really important philosophical things to say here, but nobody will take you seriously if you talk about the sacred. Uh, they'll go, oh, he's a faith head. And so I almost, for a nanosecond, wavered, but I realized that I couldn't not write it, even though it was the most difficult thing I've ever written in my life. It, cost me more blood, sweat, toys and tears uh, than anything else I've done because I wanted to be honourable to what was there. I wanted to be truthful to it. I wanted to be faithful to it and neither oversell something or understate it. And, of course, I believe that all that realm of the sacred and divine is not is not expressible in ordinary language and is not grasped by our common concepts. It is itself beyond such things. But that doesn't mean it's unreal. I mean, it's, it's just an elementary logical mistake to say, well, we can't talk about it, we can't conceive it, then it can't exist. But it can. And we can't measure it in the lab. Um, I know that. But we can't measure love in the lab. I can't demonstrate love to somebody who's never experienced it. And the sacred is like that. You can't get it from, it's like trying to learn how to swim by sitting on the bank of the river reading a book. You actually have to get into the stream. But if you do, you will find that something responds to you. I swear that it will. It may not be what you expect, but there will be this responsive encounter. And it's that that we are made for. And I believe that it's that, the business of seeing, 
experiencing, reflecting, doing our best to magnify in the world what is beautiful, good, and true that is the reason we're here at all. So we have an important, um, uh, if you like, role. And uh, we started rather late, so I'm just going to wind up in <laughs> wind up in five minutes. Um, you've probably heard of Pascal's Wager, yeah? And Pascal's Wager, for those of you who don't know it, was there may be a god or there may not. If there is a god and you decide to deny him, you've made a big mistake. But if there isn't a god and you think there is, well, no harm will come of it. And it's always seemed to me not really to cover the bases and to be a little bit venal in its, um, <laughs> in its um, motivation. But there's something called McGilchrist's wager, which goes like this. Either there is a god, in which case, yep, we better get to know that god. Or there isn't a god, in which case, no harm is done, a la Pascal. But there is this possibility that whatever the divine and the sacred is, it is exploring itself, it is coming to know itself in its creation. One might ask, why did this Logos, this Bli, this Unta, this Allah, this God, why did it bother with the creation? And the answer in most religions is that God is love. And love is relational, coming back to my idea that everything, everything is actually relational. And relations are two-way relations. So you have to have a cosmos in which something can come that can appreciate that divine ground. And it's exploring that, unfolding the beauty of it that is the purpose of the creation. And here at the very last minute, I come to the question of division and union, which I would love to give a whole hour's talk on. This is very, very important, but let me be very brief. Goethe, again, another person I very greatly admire, said, dividing the united, uniting the divided, this is the business of nature. And it is like, he says, the systole and diastole, which are the two beats of the heart. It is like the inhalation and the exhalation. And he also suggests or hints that it's like the warp and weft of a fabric into which our being is woven, he says. Now, I think that is extraordinarily important, and perhaps I just leave it there and we can explore it a bit. But in my view, everything depends on seeing this importance of having division and union, but of having them unified, not divided. Uh, this is an example of the meta position that I hold on many things. For example, I think it's great that we have both and, but we also sometimes need either or. But we don't need either both and or either or. We need both both and and either. <laughs> and I, of course, my whole work's about symmetry and asymmetry, which I think goes much further than the brain, goes into the substance of life. And I believe there that we need not just symmetry or asymmetry, but we need the asymmetry of symmetry and asymmetry. That really is a lot of work, and it's all there in the book if you want to buy it. <laughs> give you a chance to take a rest in for a second or two. Yep. Uh, quite a tour de force. Um, and I'm keen, because of time, to really involve the audience quite quickly. So I'm going to just have one question on the sacred. Um, and it relates to an experience I had with you on the Isle of Skye. Um, a little minor tragedy is that um, before the book came out, I traveled up to Skye to film a day, a day long interview with Ian about every aspect of the book, which was recorded, of course. But for a range of reasons I won't go into, we, we could never retrieve the recording. Um, but there was a moment towards the end of that, that time that I particularly wished we'd, we'd, we'd uh, got on camera. And it was a moment where Ian started welling up uh, with, with tears. And it was speaking about Christian mythology and how beautiful you found it. And one question I have for you here is, it's, to speak of the sacred um, might be threatening to scientific peers in a scientific context, and it might be ris seem risky because you're invoking 
quality of life that's, in, well, you can tell me in a minute whether you think it's supernatural or not, or whether that's the right expression. Um, but it's invoking something entirely outside. Entirely natural. Entirely natural, but outside of our normal sort of um, capacity to empirically perceive things that would be a more sort of orthodox way of looking at things. But in that moment, you know, I felt you emotionally were, you know, very deeply invested in this. And I've also noticed in some of the reviews, perhaps by Rowan Williams, perhaps by a few others, they wonder if you're sort of pulling your punches a bit. That actually, far from not including this in the book, you you culminate in the sacred. And, and yet, even in the sacred chapter, it's quite cautious and quite tempered. And we just I just wonder what stops you from saying what you just said towards the end there, something in of the order that like God exists. It's very important we come to know God and our life should be directed in that in that sense. What's what what's pulling you back from that? Yeah, I, I, I consistently, as you say, pull my punches for a good reason. Um, and actually at the end I don't say um I say that although I'm very suspicious of a lot of God talk, and although the very word God produces all kinds of complications that need to be dispensed with, I think we're too quick to say we can bypass this or dismiss it, um, and that I think it's our job to try harder to understand what this ancient truth that people have always believed is about. Why do we think we're wiser than they were? And I do actually say that nothing I have experienced is in a sense more certain to me that there is some meaning to this idea. And that's expressed in that way carefully because as Jesus said, we should be as wise as serpents but as gentle as doves. And part of my job was not to um, draw people to Christianity. I think I'm a rather bad Christian and I'm not a committed Christian and I don't go to church. On the other hand, I cannot think of a more wonderful mythos, and I use that word without any implication that it's false. Um, the mythoi by which we live are the most important kinds of truth, and if you think you don't have one, you've probably bought into the one of our age, which is that everything is a machine. That's a myth as well. And I think it's such a powerful myth about a god who is involved in the creation in such a way that he actually also experiences suffering, although there's a complex concept in theology, by the way, because he may be so-called impassable, but I don't want to go into all the details. But the, the beauty of this idea and the sheer extraordinariness of the, the art and the music and the poetry, the architecture, the words of the liturgy, the words of the King James Bible, I think these are, they speak to me directly. And I came from a family that were neither very well educated nor at all religious. And um, I, I sort of first encountered all this in my early teens. And I just thought, whatever it is that I've been taught to believe about the world is not right. I need to... I need to commit myself to understanding this. And I thought that I would probably actually become a monk after I'd um, gone to Oxford and graduated. But um, by then I saw sense and realized I'd be a very bad monk and um, would also make a very bad monastery. So um, <laughs> there we are. Just a little follow up. Um, we, we heard from Linda this morning about fortune telling. And, you know, in my group afterwards, we spoke about astrology. And, you know, th there's a sort of, uh, the, a book you may know by Jeffrey Kripal called The Flip, which um, is premised partly on seeing consciousness as primary, but not just that. There's also a lot of parapsychological -psycho data in it. Mm. And he's arguing that really there's a moment at which suddenly the world looks very, very different. Mm. Now, my impression, knowing you for many years, you care very deeply about your scientific authority and respectability, and for good reason. But I also wonder if, you know, to what extent can we go there, as it were? To what extent mm. is it legitimate to wonder if the I Ching might actually speak to you or the tarot cards might actually mm. have something to say to, about your psyche that's meaningful? Mm. Is this beyond the pale or yeah. is this? Well, not to me. Um, 
I'm far from being able to say that I know or experience or have in my world picture the whole story. I haven't. None of us has. And it's the sheer hubris of modern humanity that seems to me its worst trait. And what we need is a, a massive dose of humility, which may come, alas, with societal collapse. Um, but we certainly need to re-embrace modesty, awe, and compassion rather than anger, um, division, um, power struggles, and all of that. Um, there was a couple of things, really. Um, one, of the, one of the things I forgot to say, and I just want to say this about why I didn't bang on about Christianity, is that, as I say, I'm not necessarily sure I'm a Christian. But I also didn't want to be exclusive. I didn't want people to get there and go, oh, God, he's a Christian, so now we've got to swallow all that. But I wanted to draw on religions worldwide, and I found that they had enormous wisdom and that these wisdoms cohered. And what's more, they cohered with the position I'd been arguing for through neuropsychology, philosophy, and um, slightly physics. <laughs> Um, uh, I have a, a, t a band of what I call tame physicists, and when I want to say something in physics, I, they're, they're people who approach me and said, far more than uh, biologists, say, this book is terribly interesting to us as physicists. I know it's good. So then I send them, is this okay to say? And they go, well, yeah, probably. Um, <laughs> so um, why am I saying that? I just don't want people to think that um, Anybody should be excluded from this, even those who are very, very tentative. And I often think that the honest agnostic is the closest to somebody who's really honestly searching for God. Um, sorry, where were we before that? Well, just that um, I think... Oh, oh, yes, I'm thinking that. Yes. Um, well, it depends what you define as natural and supernatural. And I think that lots of the stuff that we've now sequestered in a cupboard marked supernatural is not at all unnatural. It depends how you look at things. If, you're, if you happen to notice certain things and things, events in life or reading something can make you open your eyes to it, you start to see it. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it's real. I think we should be sceptical. I think that scientists are not sceptical enough about their own findings. Um, I, I think we should be sceptical as thinkers, as philosophers, as scientists. But I also think we need, in the end, to be sceptical about scepticism in the sense that you can take it too far so that you're paralysed and don't really know that you can believe anything. That would be a mistake. But you see, it's not... What one believes is not something one worked out in a seminar room. It's not a, the culmination of a series of propositions. The root of the word belief is from love. It's Lieben, you know, and the old English word leaf, dear. And um, what we believe is very importantly what we are attracted to as right. What we have faith, faith is uncertain. Faith is incompatible with certainty. And faith is more valuable than certainty. Certainty means you're certainly wrong. It's one of the only certainties we can have. And so it's very important to maintain this idea. I mean, I want to say this, whatever, because I think it's so important, a reconceptualization of truth. Truth is not something out there, a distant goal that we can work our way towards. Truth is something we can encounter in this world. And it's not a, a thing. It's a process. It's a journey. And it's about not something being definite, but about a continual unconcealing. So we are unconcealing the truth. We are sweeping away misconceptions as we find our way to it, as we find our way to God, whatever we mean by that word. And this idea of truth is very important because true is at the basis of fidelity. When we talk about truth, carpenters talk about two surfaces that are true. Indeed, they say they marry. And truth is what happens when warring factions stop fighting with one another and come to what we call a truce. A truce is derived from the word true. And truth is something that we uncover in the business of living. So it's a very different thing from what goes on in the seminar room, usually. But if, if, if the seminar room takes into account pre-Socratic philosophers, modern phenomenological philosophers, it may get close. Okay, thank you.
Um, so questions now from the audience. If you can put your hands up, I think I'm going to have to do this roving <clears throat> for the recording's sake. So the mic is there to be recorded. <clears throat> I think if you want to ask a question but you don't want to be recorded, let me know, but I'll assume you do. So I'm going to um, bring the mic to you, and I'll begin. Yes. Ah. I, well, um, does anyone else want to play the roving role? Nick, are you sure? Yeah. Okay, so then um, we'll take these two at the front. If we can take a few together, it helps. Not too many, because it can become too overwhelming, but uh, maybe two at a time, and we'll see how it goes. Um, thank you, Ian. I think we all want to uh, thank you for persevering with the million words. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, you live on Sky. I live uh, on, in a tiny house on wheels in the Derbyshire Dales, mm -hmm. and I'm very careful what goes in, and your book is in, so thank you. Thank you. you say consciousness is primary, for you, is consciousness mental or material or neither of the, neither of the above? OK, so that one. Oh, yeah, th thank you, Ian. Um, I'm looking at the two lights behind you, which are on all the time. And it made me think about the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere. Do they, do they g flicker one on, then the other, one on, and the other? Or are they? both on at the same time, or do they fade in and out? Do you have a sense of that? Okay, you can take those two together. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'll deal with that question first. And both our hemispheres are operating all the time. Um, which one is guiding our attention uh, is more a matter of a divided role. And as, um, so effectively, we don't need to be thinking and shouldn't be thinking that we are just using our left hemisphere or right. What, what I'm talking about there is a shorthand. I believe that in this world, when we enter into discourse, we don't like contradictions. If you contradict yourself, that's almost worse than talking nonsense. Anyone will listen to nonsense as long as it's coherent with itself. But actually, <laughs> truths are often very, very complicated and require different things that we go, well, that doesn't add up. I mean, the left hemisphere is very quick to dismiss anything that seems contradictory or paradoxical. The second question, or well, the first question actually, um, is very good, but I think that what you've done there is reinforce a division that I don't think is correct between the mental and the physical. So consciousness is the ground of both mental and physical life, and the physical life is the material expression of consciousness, which we also have in an immaterial way. So um, consciousness, let me give you this image. Um, what is water? Well, you think you know what water is. It's that translucent stuff that, that flows. But it's also that very hard, opaque, white stuff that's extremely cold and can crack your head open. And it's also in this room. I mean, this upper part of this room is filled with water. But we're alive and we don't see it. So um, there are different ways in which consciousness can be manifest. And if you like, a congealed form of consciousness is what matters. I want to get to the position where um, I don't collapse the division between my mind and the consciousness of the, the rest of the universe, or the garden, or you, but that we, so we don't collapse the two, but we don't entirely divide them either. We live in a culture in which we think division means separation, but it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't mean actually having to separate. It's being able to see the difference. And the best example of this is in a bar magnet, where there's a North Pole and the South Pole, and they're completely contrary to one another, but they're never separate. In fact, neither of them can possibly exist without the other, and there isn't a hard division where they cease. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> wow, more hands. Okay, um, Isabella and um, uh, Milky, just opposite. Yeah, thank you, Ian, for this great talk. I moved again. Um, to hear your story, and I'm most interested right now to hear uh, whether you had an experience that brought you to the place you are right now in terms of your feeling of the sacred, or was it purely through studying? So from my experience, reading you and poetry has brought me as close to a religious experience as I've ever had. Um, and I, I, that sounds too much, but it, it is true. And I'm wondering whether it's for you becoming a scientist and doing the work and thinking conceptually and feeling something that you didn't 
get from that that brought you to digging deeper and then having an experience or the other way around? Okay, thank you. Um, take Milky's question as well, please. Just there, Nick. Um, I believe you kind of touched on it uh, with your conversation uh, with Jonathan, uh, but uh, you mentioned four elements, uh, science, rationality, uh, imagination. Science, reason. Reason, reason, mm. yeah. And I forgot the other imagination, one. Imagination, intuition. Yeah. Intuition. But um, there is, I think there is a missing part, at least it feels to me, memory, oh, sure. re me me memory, remembrance, mm. uh, um, footprints of people who have been, you touched on it at the end, I think, in your conversation. Uh, and another thing I want to add was, if you give an advice to a technologist, someone working in the tech sector, what would that be? Okay, let's <laughs> sneak that one into the end. How do you save the world from AI quickly? Um, so um, Isabella's question, where did the sense come from, from ratiocination and study, or from some kind of revelation or experience? Um, it's never come from revelation. Um, and oddly, I, I don't think I've had any revelations in my... <laughs> I mean, other than suddenly going, oh, wow, when I experience a work of art or something like that. I don't know whether that counts. Or just a very beautiful scene. I've been saying, oh, wow, all my life. But are these really revelations? Not in the kind of way that I think you're suggesting. So it's been an accretion of experience that has been cohesive since I was a teenager. I mean, I remember as a teenager having a very strong view that the whole was not the same as the sum of the parts. And I couldn't explain it. And people would say, so what's this mysterious something else that gets put in when you put the parts together? And of course, I didn't know how to answer that. I wouldn't know now. But so it was, it was continuous as a piece of life. The, the question that um, you asked, uh, Milty, um, uh, yes, memory. You see, the way I think of that is that it's a sort of subset of all the things I've mentioned. So science needs to remember to amass and to bear in mind past experience. Reason is based, uh, in my view, not just on logical working of things out, but being able to make the right analogies to see the correct context, all of which comes from experience. And uh, one way of talking about experience is memory. And I would say the same thing about intuition and imagination, that they're fed into by memory. Uh, but thank you for drawing my attention to it, because I think memory is a very interesting topic. And I'm thinking hard about actually what I think about memory now, because we're beginning to think that living organisms must respond to imprints that we can't find in DNA. And they may be in fields that bear such memories. This is this has been considered rather wacko in the past. I hope Rupert Sheldrake will live long enough. <laughs> Um, dear man to see himself vindicated, as I'm sure he will be. Thank you. Um, just a follow, brief follow-up on Isabella's question, because it was such a profound one. Um, you did say, did you not, and during the talk, I thought I heard you say words to the effect that if you, there was something along the lines of, if you listen, if you attend, you will feel, heal the response. It wasn't, it wasn't quite, if you listen for God, you'll hear, but it was a little bit like that. And so I just wonder to push back slightly on what you said about the accretion, because that makes it sound still quite safe. There is a sense in which you're experiencing a relationship in your life, is there not? Many relationships um, with, with the divine, if one can say that, I believe, with nature, with people. Um, and I sometimes think, you know, you mentioned, if you listen, you'll hear God speak. I, I do listen. And, and God doesn't speak. And, uh, and uh, I, I've sometimes said, hey, look, it wouldn't hurt you just once. <laughs> <laughs> say, say something. Just to confirm that you are there in communication with me. And then I immediately think, and maybe that is God speaking in me. But I spoke to you this morning when you looked out of the landscape. I spoke to you this morning when you got a phone call I speak to you all the time. What's the problem? Okay, wonderful. Thank you. More questions. Um, Darius and uh, so Nick, just one over at this corner here, because then we'll get the cluster. I can see a cluster emerging. We're coming to you. We'll take Darius and then we'll move to the cluster. Thank you. So the, you've been using two sets of terms. One is ground of being, and then you've also talked about God. So is that a distinction that is, is clear to you? I mean, God is generally like a, a pers personification, some, some entity with a personality, while ground of being connects 
to other traditions like Taoism, which do not pers personify the ground of being. It's a, it's a, it's a profound mystery, and once we perf personify it, we're actually over-defining it and, and making too many assumptions about right, it. Right, right, so that, yeah. I, I think we'll take this, no, Ian, that's such a big one, I think. You basically, we just asked, is God, is God a person, if I understood it correctly? Um, yeah, I think so, because it's too big to get with another question. It is a big question, and a, a very good one. Um, of course, what I mean by the ground of being is that which, in a way, it doesn't kick-start being in a temporal sense. It's not the cause in the sequence, but that underwrites all being. So it is there as the, the ground of being. And this is where I want to mention the Trinity, a Christian concept, although I discovered that it's actually a very ancient concept that um, <clears throat> was in many pre-Christian uh, belief systems. But at school, this always seemed to be manifestly absurd, and I always felt um, a squirm factor when the Trinity was mentioned. I mean, what is this about the man, the boy, and the bird? You know, um, it doesn't make any sense to me. As I've um, matured in my thinking, I realize it's extremely important as an expression of what I was much more able to accept, which is panentheism. And uh, just to gloss that for people who are not familiar with the term, Pantheism is the belief that God is just the sum of everything. I don't believe that. But panentheism is the belief that God is in everything and that everything is in God, has its being in God. So that God is never separate from anything in the cosmos. And it, the, the, the way in which that manages to work for me is that it manages to bridge um, the debate about whether God is... Um, uh, what's the word? Um, suddenly lost the words. Um, Female? Female? I'm just kidding. That wasn't, that wasn't the word. No, no. Um, no, the God is... Um, uh, oh, I hate this. Um, beyond transcendent. Thank you. So that's something that came with. Whether God is transcendental or imminent. And um, I believe that it's important to be able to hold both of these things in the way describing without collapsing into one or the other and in that sense god is both the sort of ground of being and the process of this cosmos i said that it was in or he or however you like to put it i find it unsatisfactory she is also unsatisfactory i just stick with he because it's conventional and he whatever is that other is um, also in the process of creation and is present in within us right now and it was made um uh, made clear to me by a, a simple franciscan monk in my teens who said well think of it like a book where is the book is it in the mind of the writer or is it in this book on the table here or is it what happens when you read the book and those are the three things and it's also in rumi i like to be able to bridge these things rumi says it is the water source. It is the water that flows to the cup, and it is the water that is drunk. Thank you. I can just check with the audience. I'm conscious of time and energy, and so we're at the beginning of the end now. There's a cluster of questions here that we will take. But I'm just conscious um, that we're talking about God, and um, there was a time when I first met Ian, maybe a decade or so ago, where that would have created quite a strong degree of discomfort. And I'm just wondering if anyone cares to put their hand up, if you feel that talking about God is somehow discomforting, uncomfortable. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Yep. Any, any more? Don't be shy. I'm sure you have lots of allies. Right. Because some people, might, yeah, there's a sort of tacit coercion sometimes baked into the conversation. Just good to know you're, you know, that's not surprising, and, and many would feel it. Other questions now? The cluster? Could I just comment on that? that it's exactly avoidance of coercion that led me into the position you twitted me with first, which was you don't seem to come out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want any. I didn't want any of my readers yeah. to feel he's got designs on me. But I, I don't. And yeah. I'm constantly, you know, going. It doesn't have. To, nobody has certainty. 
I, I do appreciate that's the intent. I'm also wondering, though, whether it's felt so palpably that the, in, the intent is somehow less important than the experience, that this is in the room, as it were. Um, so, okay, we have a cluster here. Let's take it. Yes, the hand's been up for a long time. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ian. Um, I wanted to follow up and dive a dip, bit, deep, bit deeper into what you mentioned about friction as not only that which creates resistance and conflict, but that which propels. It's sort of the heart at the heart of the fabric of drama and expression in, in the cosmos. And particularly in within your work, how you see deception as an essential part of this friction. Um, I want to differentiate it in two ways. Perhaps the left brain side of deception being that which is asserting a particular story to enable a certain way of being to sort of self-justify self itself. And the perhaps more right side, uh, uh, right side of deception, which would be that which you find in the greatest forms of art, whether it's poetry or comedy or even science, where it's a form of deception that unearths its own limitations, speaking to its own limits of language, or it's something that unravels into further creativity. And I'd be curious how deception ties into your work. Okay, Ian, thank you. We'll take a few more questions if you don't mind. Hold the question about deception. One bridge just in front of there, Nick. And thank you. Um, thank you, Ian, for your very important ideas. Um, my thoughts are in Alice in Wonderland and Moby Dick, some very important ideas were hidden and passed on to a public that might not uh, uh, go very deep initially. Um, in the age of uh, shortened attention span, which, which we have now, how would you feel and have you thought about if your ideas were... Um, uh, packaged in, a, say, a Netflix show or something yeah. that that would make it more accessible. And what, for what age group would you feel it would be most appropriate and effective? Okay, thank you. So let's take those two then: deception and then yeah. mm, genres. Well, the first thing I'd have to say about perception is to go back to the neuroscience, and I wouldn't want some. Can I switch on? Yeah, yeah this, it was deception, right? If I heard correctly, not perception. Oh, you but said yeah, perception. no deception. And the different kinds of deception that, that there was might be a kind of creative deception in the right in the right hemisphere, as I understood it, whereas the left hemisphere's deception was invariably maladaptive in some way. If I've okay. done um, justice to the I'm question, I'm struggling to understand if I can relate to right hemisphere deception. Well. Yeah. The trouble is that I think that, as even Mike Gazzaniga, who's the biggest mechanist in the world, um, believes, the, 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 the left hemisphere is not really interested in truth. And so it does project the most massive lies. <laughs> and it's also vastly overconfident that it's right. So it is... A, it is the home of mistakes and deceptions. I'm trying to think how the right hemisphere would deceive us, except in as much as it would um, not contain what it is the left hemisphere can say or would say. So, but the left hemisphere is different from the right hemisphere in its relation with the other hemisphere. So the left hemisphere is exclusive of the right hemisphere, but the right hemisphere is inclusive of what the left hemisphere knows. And actually, in the image of the master and his emissary, the title of my earlier book, it's the master that actually instructs the emissary to go and do this work, expects the emissary to report back, but the emissary goes off on a thing that it's the master. So... Okay. Uh, uh, more? Okay, more? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I will just feel that th there's so much more to come. I think there is, but I don't know how to press yeah, it. Yeah, it's, it's we'll hold the question in the air. Yeah. Um, but the, the subsequent question about genre, I mean, you have had, uh, almost like I see a, a sort of you know, many different kinds of, uh, I was about to say Russian doll, if I'm honest, and then I suddenly felt the sort of political weight of that. Um, but I was thinking that the, the number of different kinds, you've had, uh, you know, uh, I would say animate, that yeah. there weren't seen by many millions. Yeah. There's been a kind of, uh, yeah, documentary. There's been, yeah, all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I have Jonathan very much to thank for this, because he said after I'd given this talk, um, 
we have somebody who will turn it into a cartoon. And I said, oh, God, no. And that's the absolute worst thing they can have. Because this stuff is already, you know, in most people's mind, the pop idea of the two hemispheres is ridiculously a caricature. So I don't want that. And then after a while, he said, no, I've talked to the guy, and he's read your book, and he really understands it. And so I said, okay. And then on the day the thing came out, the actual talk, it was about 11 months after the talk had gone up, my talk had 12,000 views. That afternoon, the animate had 46,000 views. And so I'm completely converted to this. <laughs> and, and, and I'm delighted to report, I don't know if you know this, actually. Yeah, I do, I do. You do, yes. That the guy who did it uh, contacted me and said that he wanted to come and interview me for the purposes of making some more. And he came and interviewed me for, for three, or, three or four hours, and he's going to make, he says, um, five or six very short animus. And that will, that will be a very helpful move, I think. I, I don't think it's that people have become incapable of this kind of attention, but they, you're quite right that they need some kind of way in. They need a lure, yes, right. exactly. OK, thank you. We have a few more questions. So, uh, Nick, yeah. A, a yeah, thank you. At the back, we've got, I've noticed you at the side. I've noticed the two wings here. We have Dominic. I know, Dominic, you've been trying for a while. I get it. And we have to take one at the back first, though. Quick question: You, um, you're, you're a very observation. You're a very convinced monotheist, whereas very convinced monotheist. No, he's not. Monotheist, yeah, whereas most religious people uh, entertain the existence of many spirits and beings and gods and goddesses and demons and so on. And so forth. that's an observation. The question is: Different traditions and communities use the word spirit or energy. And you use consciousness. Are they talking about the same thing, or is there a reason? Is consciousness somehow different? It's talking about something different. Yes. Okay. I, I think that's a big one, Nick. We'll take that one first. Big one is, I mean, ultimately, I'd say that these things can't be neatly carved out from one another. But I still think that it's very useful to use different terms. It's very important to use the terms North Pole or South Pole correctly of a magnet, but, uh, you know, effectively they exist together, they co-create one another and so on. Um, I, I mean, polytheism is interesting, but I think that it's a step behind what I'm trying to say, which is that is the union of division and union. So it's not unreasonable for this God that is, if you like, ever present in, in the world to take different manifestations at different times. And maybe when, when I have an experience that I think is of the sacred, then that is a very particular thing. And in the past, if it had taken place in a wood or a, you know, on a mountain, it would have been a different god. I don't think that's really necessary. Um, and I think that there are differences between spirit and consciousness and god. I mean, consciousness is part of the cosmos that... God is the ground of. Um, what I mean by spirit is not just my consciousness. My consciousness could be um, engaged in something absolutely nefarious or, or, or horrible or trivial. But it, that is not spirit. What you mean by spirit, I believe, and what I mean by spirit is something rather special, not just any old consciousness. And so we have a word for it. That seems to me okay. Okay. Thank you. There's so many other questions. Nick. Um, and also, you've described yourself as a Taoist, but we'll come back to that maybe in a subsequent question. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I know, I know, Dominique. I'm, I'm a, don't worry, saving the best for last. Um, I just want to thank you um, for the ways that you articulate uh, and bring to language um, things around. Uh, maybe I, I know I have a quiet voice. Um, just extending gratitude uh, for the ways that you're bringing to language. Um, it's okay now. It's okay now. Matters you can, you can of it, of the you sacred. You can hear it, please. Okay, try again, Zoya. Sorry. You sound very muffled. Right, 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 right. <laughs> okay, one, one. Just expressing deep gratitude uh, for the ways that you're bringing to lexicon um, ideation of the sacred and. Uh, innate ways of knowing. Um, I feel like the colonization of God is like one of the greatest unravelings uh, that many of us experience in this age. And um, I found the metaphor of the violin and that duality being important and of the, the, no of the poles being really important, uh, really poignant in this time of uh, what we witness all around or what's 
bombarded all around us around division. Um, and I wanted to ask this, this uh, I wanted to like zoom in on this um, duality of division and unifying or, or how you might bring that to words. What does that mean for each of us acting in this age uh, in response to the extent of the divisive epistemologies of material reductionism? What kind of rigor does that require of, of each of us acting as agents in, in this in Okay, this thank time? you, Zoe. Even before you answer, we need to take the last round of questions, okay, because I think just because of time. So I've got this question in mind, and hopefully you have to. Okay, quickly, please. Yeah, um, what, what's driving you? What's your life's mission? Okay, good one, good one. We'll, we'll hold that thought. And a few more, please. Yes, Dominic, okay, well, Dominic's going last, because I've already promised that. Um, um, yeah, it's a f sort of related to what Linda was saying about, um, I, I was very struck by her talking about this morning, about things like um, uh, fortune telling, and which is a long way from, from the sense of the sacred that I was getting from your book, but it's a lot m more closer to what everyday understanding of the spiritual is and the, 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 there's one part in your book where you touch on near-death experiences but say you're not going to go into that um, and I s suspect for the reasons you've already explained around other stuff with the spiritual okay. what I, I'm fascinated by is that near-death experiences are actually very very well documented now okay. uh, and in a way if that were better known, that might be a way of pushing us past this sense that w the place we're in at the moment, okay. where basically humanism rules and okay, says, okay, when okay. you're dead, you're I dead. We've got the question, near-death experiences, question mark. And, uh, okay, Steve and then, do oh, we've got, sorry, one, two, three, and then we're done. Okay, yes, please. We won't be able to answer all of them, but Ian's such a brilliant synthesizer, he'll get to the gist. Okay, <laughs> so, question. Uh, I'm interested in how you feel this work is landing in society. So um, how have you been most touched by the receipt of this work and most disappointed? Okay, great. And then Steve? Yeah, we'll, go, yeah, we'll take two more and then we're, then we're really... Do you want to answer these? Okay, 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 okay. Let's, let's answer, let's answer. Yeah. Okay, we can do two sets then if people can... Yeah, fine, go ahead. Kind of what I'm here for, but that's okay. Go ahead. Okay. So Zoya has a question about the, the, the violin metaphor, the, the tension. What does it mean in real life? How do you put it into action? It's the technique, I suspect, not the microphone. Uh, why is this? This always happens to me that the person who's interviewing me has a good microphone. And I, <laughs> this has repeatedly happened. There is a God, after all. Um, also, I was amused when I was... Um, Chalk Valley Festival, um, I was being interviewed by Jonathan Gaisman and he had 25 questions and we had about 30 minutes. And I said, I'm going to try and be concise. And he said, well, I've never seen that before. Um, <laughs> but the trouble is that I'm trying to compress a lot. Um, that's my excuse anyway. I think that the idea of the division and union is very important in resolving tensions because we're not... Um, but, I, but almost more important, because I'm short of time, I'm going to say this. I think that the elements that are required are humility, charity, or compassion, and a degree of awe be before the extent of the things we can't know, don't know. So people's certainty that they're right, that the other person must be wrong, that they must be terrible because they held an opinion that they don't hold, this is all utterly horrible. And nobody should be forbidden to say what they honestly and truly believe, as long as they don't say it in a in a very inflammatory and horrible way. So I, I'm really worried about that in society, and I think the answer is not to ban people all the time, but actually to do the precise opposite, but to sit people down and listen. And look, it's not very complex. You can have marital therapy between a couple that are at one another's throats, and you get the person to speak, and then you say, no, your turn's coming. Now, what did your partner just say? No, that wasn't what I said at all. Now, that actually would be a very, very useful exercise. I'm going to be really annoying to you because I, I want to uh, say something else while I'm on this topic because I didn't have a chance to talk about, which is values. Effectively, there is only one value for the left hemisphere, and it's power. And the entire debate about everything 
since about the middle of the 19th century, from Marx onwards, has been about power. Every way we look at things is about power. It's the only value that counts. If you're an artist, it's no longer good enough to be beautiful, to have beautiful work. It's almost a put down. It's powerful. And that's the only thing we respect nowadays is power. And you may say, well, that's the, 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 the way men have left it. But don't let's embrace that. Let's try to get away from it. Let's not just drill further into power. Let's talk about beauty, goodness, and truth. Until we talk about beauty, goodness, and truth as our guides, we are stuffed. Okay. Now, there was another question and another one and another yeah. one. Yeah, well, the, the big, big question was the, the, the purpose of your life. I mean, there was a big question about what's driving you and what's... Oh, yeah. Where's, yeah, the, where's yeah, the fire yeah. that we just heard come from? Well, it's quite easy to answer. I don't know, but in retrospect, my life has made sense. At the time, it never did. Yeah. I mean, why did I... I wanted to do philosophy at university, but for various reasons I didn't. I, it wasn't an honours degree, the one I wanted to do, philosophy and theology, so instead I, I read literature. Why did I do that? I know. Why did I switch to science and medicine? Why, you know, in retrospect, it all makes sense. But what drives me is, if you like, and it is a driver, it's a demon. I mean, I have a daimon, you know, in, in, in Plato's sense, that is very cruel and won't give me time off and says, no, you might want to do that, but no, you're sitting down at this desk and you're going to write. And but I, the reason I want to do that is because I believe that I have a vision that is coherent, and I believe that it changes the way people look at life. I know this. I absolutely know it from all the feedback I get. And so as long as I've got breath in my body, I'm willing to go around trying to promulgate it. Which takes me to this question about how it's landing, your impression of how this is landing. Um, my impression is that it's landing very well across the educated, intelligent, reading public. Um, there's a deafening silence from <laughs> neurology and... No, not from neurology and psychiatry, but from neuroscience. So I've had tons of wonderful um, messages from neurologists and psychiatrists all around the world, but not from neuroscientists, except for Raman Chandran, but he's a clinician as well. Um, and so some very big names in the field have responded. But what hasn't happened is I've been able to move on neuroscience. And neuroscientists are people who let spend their life in the lab. But neurologists and psychiatrists actually encounter people. Oh! And, you know, they, the brain, that's got nothing to do with people, but it has. And, you know, I've got Mike Gazaniger on the film, this film, The Divided Brain. And he actually says, you know, he takes these findings of neuroscience and so on, and then he applies them to the lives of real people. I'm not comfortable with that. Well, I'm not comfortable with you, Mike, because you're, you're not doing the job you should be doing there. Anyway. Before you threaten Mike further. Um, <laughs> so, oh, is there really another one there? Are you sure? Was it, or did we just not get to it? No, there is. There's a man who asked me over no, here. I think we got... Did we... There's one more question okay, over here, which was, uh, what has pleased me or displeased me? Yeah? Um, well, that was a similar question. But okay, let's let's take the new ones, I think, because we really have to... Well, it's, it's, not, it's not the same. I want, I want to respond yeah, to Yeah, I was just asking but, but, yeah. about but that, that thing about near-death experiences, but I think it's a different oh, question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, look, I'm not against them, as you were. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't mind having one. None of these things ever seems to come my way. But um, uh, maybe one day it will. But no, I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm appropriately detached from it. I prefer to believe the evidence. I know there are very good scientists involved in the area. But I have enough battles to fight without people going, oh, I see. So he's one of those people who believes in seances and things. I don't know what I think about seances. But I, I, I really have to fight my battles a bit. And it's about restricting. I've got enough to cover without having to cover things that will only land me in, in the soup. OK, okay. Stephen and Dominic. But I, I want, yeah, who was the man who asked me what yeah, pleased if, me? If you don't mind, some discipline. Thing. So where, Jonathan? Steve. <laughs> Stephen and Dominic, yeah. All right. I want to say what pleased me and what didn't. You can, you can. You have the mic. You can answer that at the end. I can say, all right, go on, yeah. Hey, Ian, um, my question is, um, it might be a little late for this question now, but um, I'm curious, why do you think the pre we went in the direction in the Western world after the pre-Socratics in the direction that we went? and didn't follow 
what you know some of the profound because mm. I'm with you I think the pre-socratics are extraordinary yes. but why did we take that direction mm, yes <laughs> uh, so uh, actually my question Might is quite quick I think do my Tom Jones uh, perhaps impression. it's quick but I wanted to go back to the brain and you said something, you were talking about Jude Caravan, and you said that animate life enables the speed of consciousness. And I wondered why that's important. And then it was kind of a follow-up on that question, which was related to what Linda said, which was, could we, you know, you were talking about consciousness and matter, and um, could consciousness be another way to think of time, and that matter enables the flow of time? Okay, if I can remember all of that when we get there. Um, so, history of ideas, yes. I mean, really, so as not to waste time. I don't really know. I, I think what happened was there was a, um, a great deal of commerce with the East, with India, with Persia, and so forth, and that many of the ideas one finds in those cultures and in Greece at the time of the pre-Socratics are very consonant with one another. And then something happened in which we s took a step back and started to inspect ourselves more self-consciously. And that's what gave rise to this process. And I, I found something very interesting in Whitehead the other day, which is a society thrives until it starts to overanalyze itself. I believe that's where we're at now. Um, yes. Um, well, rather, as I said before, there's a reason why we have these different words, because um, <sighs> Yes, yes. Yes, all right. I think probably the way I put it was was suboptimal, thank you. Um, I, what I would have been better to say was that responsiveness is what life magnifies. So th there is a way in which inanimate matter is responsive. If water comes, eventually it moves and so on. So there's a kind of very slow process, but it's not going to give rise to a satisfying sense of the divine. So you need to create, as it were, creatures that are much, much more responsive. And they respond faster, they respond more deeply, and they respond more broadly. So that's what I meant to say. And I think that's what life brings to the party. Um, the other Finally, I think you have a chance to say what Steve from the Spruce do now. No, 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 because there's a time if thing. You want, if you want to do yeah. I mean, in the chapter on time, I, I, I think we mis I, I suggest that we misconceive time because we don't understand the nature of flow. And consciousness may be a kind of flow, but first of all, I'd have to talk about how flow is different when you're inspecting it from the outside and when you're actually in it. And so when you're standing on the edge of a river with a, a stopwatch and a clipboard, um, time and the river seem to be passing. If you get into that river and move in the exact flow of the river, um, time will appear no longer to be a, an issue because you're moving with it. And so time, time is in itself absolutely fascinating, but I wouldn't want to say collapse it into consciousness. Um, I think time can exist without, without our self-consciousness, um, if you say that it's part of the structure of the universe, which I believe it is, and consciousness is the origin of, of, of everything there, then uh, I see what you're getting at. But I, I, I'm just nervous of conflating things that ought to be kept separate. So, <laughs> no, I just wanted to say, I mean, I really... <sighs> My first book I wrote in my 20s was called Against Criticism, and it sold about 400 copies, and it then got unceremoniously remained it. Um, it it's slightly satisfying to me that if you now try to buy a copy, it will cost you £2,000. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, <laughs> um, I didn't believe that the master and his emissary would take off. I genuinely didn't, and it caused a change of my life, because I actually gave up the day job in order to lecture and write further. And the good side of that was I could live on Sky, and the bad side of that was that um, I took a 90% cut in income. 
But what has really staggeringly moved me, and it really does move me every day, is people who write to me saying, this book changed my life. I mean, if an author gets that once in a lifetime, they should be overjoyed. But I do hear it time and again. And people also say, which makes me feel I must be onto something, somehow I knew all this, but I had no way of articulating it, defending it, but you have given me confidence. This is so moving. I mean, after all, one of the reasons I went into psychiatry, I can say, is because I wanted to investigate the mind-body problem. That's true. That's very sort of top level. But another level, you know, I had wanted to be a monk. I decided I didn't really want to be a priest, but I felt very happy being a doctor. And I had a very warm relationship with, ship with my patients. And one of the things that crossed my mind is if I'm going to retire from that, well, that's going to leave a huge hole in your life. Actually, it didn't, because I've met so many people through this work, and I was free to do other things. But anyway, I just wanted to say that I'm enormously grateful um, to them for that, and I, d I hope that people will continue to write, because everybody's contribution is somehow different, and, and it increases the feeling that it was okay to go through all the, you know, the loneliness of the long-distance runner, because it really has been a very, very, very long and hard grind at many times. And I, I don't really, although I may appear to be confident, I don't really I have that kind of imposter syndrome. And when people say, no, this thing really means something to me, that means something very great to me. So I just want to thank you all very much. Thank you.